Welcome back. Joining me now for a debate on whether the time has come to curb the powers of the Rajya Sabha is JDU MP Pavan Verma, Akali Dal MP Naresh Gujral, Congress MP and spokesperson Abhishek Manu Singhvi, BJP spokesperson Sambit Patra, and the former Secretary General of the Lok Sabha, PDT Achari. Sambit Patra, yesterday speaking in Bombay, the Finance Minister for the second time this year called for a debate to question to what extent the indirectly elected upper house can hold up reform or other legislation passed by the directly elected lower house which he says represents the will of the people. Now, I want to ask you a simple question. Is this a reflection of the finance minister's frustration because GST and land acquisition amendments are stalled in the Rajya Sabha or does he have good grounds for demanding such a debate? No, definitely there are good grounds, but I would say even if Mr. Arun Jaitley was frustrated because of the fact that GST and the land bill were not passed, it is quite genuine a cause in the sense that the frustration would be quite, uh, I mean anyone who's sane mind would be frustrated looking at what was happening in the parliament this time. I mean if uh, Mr. Jaitley or any minister of this government is frustrated with the fact that GST could not be passed, the frustration I would call as genuine because of the very fact that GST is not a personal demand for the Bharati Janata Party or the government. It is for the country. Okay. If GST adds 1.5 to 2 percentage of, uh, to the GDP, it's but natural that GD, I mean, GST should see the light of the day. But because of political reasons, when such important bills as GST and the land bills are stalled on the upper house, definitely it's the reason of okay. why. And that's the reason as to why Mr. Arun Jaitley, an astute politician and a well-read man, in fact, has kept this view. Pavan Varma, the finance minister compared the Indian Rajya Sabha to the British upper house, the House of Lords, where progressively in the last century curbs have been placed on the House of Lords' capacity to either veto or delay legislation. But the question I want to ask you is this, how mm. apt is the comparison between our Rajya Sabha and their House of Lords? After all, the House of Lords is unelected. And secondly, it operates on the hereditary or the appointment principle. The Rajya Sabha, on the other hand, is indirectly elected. And additionally, the Rajya Sabha represents the states in our federal system. So is that in your eyes an apt comparison? I don't believe it's an apt comparison, uh, Karan. Uh, Article 79 of the Constitution says that Parliament consists of the President and the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. The makers of our constitution gave very careful thought in the constituent assembly about the powers of the upper chamber or the council of states as it was later called. And it created a system of checks and balances which I believe broadly has stood the test of time. For instance, as an example, I will say to you that money bills can only be introduced in the Lok Sabha. The Raj Sabha does not have powers as an indirectly elected house to stall or amend a money bill beyond debating it for 14 days and it can only recommend amendments to it. But there are other balances also that a constitutional amendment must be passed by a majority in both houses. So careful, I'm just giving one example, I can give many more. The Raj Sabha was created in order to prevent hasty legislation and allow okay. a parallel house which represents the will of the states as part of a federal polity to apply its mind to the efficacy of such laws and perhaps and most in all cases improve upon it. Okay. That is the purpose for it and I can give you one example. No, no, don't give me more examples. In the examples. two sessions prior to this one, no, 48 no. bills were passed Absolutely, by the Absolutely, but we are not talking about how many bills are passed, we are talking about this different issue. Is the comparison between the House of Lords and the Rajya Sabha apt or not? And you answer that, you believe it's not apt. I want to pursue that a little bit with you, Mr. Chari. To begin with, the first critical question is, can the power of the Rajya Sabha to either delay or veto legislation be amended without damaging the federal nature of our constitution, wherein the Rajya Sabha represents the states in a way in which the Lok Sabha does not? See, I am a little baffled by this talk about curtailing the powers of the Rajya Sabha because of a certain situation which has arisen in Parliament. See, the Parliament consists of the President and the two houses as per our constitution. And the powers and the role of Rajya Sabha 
have been laid down and described in the constitution very clearly. Of course, it is true that so far as the money bills are concerned. But Rajasabha, we're not talking about money bills, yes, so leave that aside. Well, curtailing the power of the Rajya Sabha. Now, for what? For what purpose? Is it because there is a perceived block of legislations in the Rajya Sabha? Yes, the I answer think, is yes. I think uh, it is very unrealistic to talk about legislations being blocked by the Rajya Sabha. Because the constitution of India is very clear. If the Rajya Sabha rejects a bill which has been passed by the Lok Sabha and transmitted to it, and if there is a disagreement on a particular amendment between the two houses, uh, I'll then come, no, I, I will just complete I, I'll it. I'll come to joint session this moment, time, sir. But I want to ask you a specific question before that. I want to ask you this. Given that the Rajya Sabha is designed to represent the states and does so in our federal system in a way in which the Lok Sabha does not, if in that situation you were to put curbs and restraints on how long the Rajya Sabha can hold up a bill, would that damage the federal nature of our constitution? No, that certainly, if you, if you curb the powers of the Rajya Sabha, um, certainly that will affect the federal uh, character of uh, the, the Indian... Uh, so, in your eyes, inherent in Mr. Jaitley's proposal, and it is only a proposal, is a clause or a concept that would damage the federal nature of our constitution? Well, well I do not know under what circumstances he has made this proposition, but looking at the issue as it is, I would say that there is no need and it is not justified to curb the powers of the Rajya Sabha. Okay. Abhishek Singh, I want to put a different aspect of the Arun Jaitley proposal to you. Can the power of the Rajya Sabha be amended without damaging the key role an upper house plays in a bicameral parliament to check the lower house or to balance the lower house, particularly when the lower house has a majority belonging to one party? Uh, I have many other things to say, but to first answer your question, it's a very good question because my view is that although untested till now, a abolition or a severe curtailment of the upper house, which de facto makes it, uh, you know, impotent or very weak, would possibly violate the basic structure of the Indian constitution itself. Obviously untested because nobody has tried it. It is surprising, as somebody put it, a well-read person like Mr. Jetley can make so superficial a suggestion. It would require a whole-scale amendment to the Constitution. A Constitution can't be tinkered with. It's a holistic, integrated structure. You can't tinker and say, just like money bills exception is there, we'll add exception A, B and C again. There is a holistic spirit to the whole thing. And without a constitutional amendment, for which there appears to be absolutely no consensus, it's not even a starter or even a talker. More than that, Amer uh, England is a particularly inept example because it's the most unitary of countries. Kenneth Weir, a famous uh, writer in Australia, said that it's wrong to call us uh, uh, like, uh, based on the English constitution. We are federal or quasi-federal. We are not unitary at all like England. And one more thing, Karan, uh, is it not a little opportunistic and hypocritical that these great grand ideas did not strike them when they were in the opposition? Well, great when grand ideas usually strike when there's a when need. when more time was lost Remember, than by one disruption. Remember, reform happens when there's a is need. That not opportunism is inherent in the requirement. No, no, the point is, no, but this uh, a, a abolition or reduction of the power of Rajya Sabha Karan is not a GST specific issue. Okay. It's not a law specific issue. Quite right. We are, we are extrapolating from an individual case to a structural change, which is completely wrong. I take your point and therefore what you're really saying is don't jump to conclusions and just because of I one particular instance. So let, me, let, me, let me bring in Naresh Gujarat at that point. Naresh Gujarat, I accept as you've just heard Abhishek Singh point out that reform of the Rajya Sabha for now is ruled out simply because it's a constitutional amendment. Neither the BJP nor the NDA have the members to push through a constitutional amendment that requires a two-thirds vote which you simply don't have with the Rajya Sabha. But what about accepting some conventions that apply in Britain. Conventions are different to reforms. For instance, Britain has a Salisbury Convention which ensures that bills which are part of the election manifesto of a government are passed by the upper house even when the government doesn't have a majority there. 
Now that would apply to this situation, but it could apply to any other situation in reverse when Congress were to come to power five days, five years down the road. Do you think we need our equivalent of the Salisbury Convention in India? Karan, first of all, I totally agree with Mr. Jaitley that the Rajya Sabha cannot hijack the economic reform uh, policies of the government of the day. They have the mandate of the people, they came with certain promises, and they must be allowed to respect those policies, uh, those uh, promises. As far as the Rajya Sabha is concerned, the framers of our constitution very wisely gave the, the, some powers to the Rajya Sabha so that if the members of the Rajya Sabha felt that Lok Sabha members had acted in haste, then they could look at it and send it back. In case of money bill, they could send it back, but thereafter, after 15 days, automatically it would become law, but non-money bills could be sent back. Now, framers of our constitution never uh, envisaged a, a situation where members of the Rajya Sabha would neither debate, nor discuss, or vote, but walk into the well of the house day after day, disrupt disrupting the proceedings of the house. Now, that is not acceptable. And obviously, some way out is, is, uh, has to be found out of this situation. So let me put this to you then. The Salisbury Convention is possibly a way out. I want to explain it again for the audience and then ask you, Naresh Gujral, whether you believe we should have something similar here. In Britain, under the Salisbury Convention, bills which are part of the election manifesto of a government are automatically passed by the upper house, even if the government doesn't have a majority in the upper house. Should that convention apply in India? I think now the way our politics has moved, we require some such thing. Rajya Sabha may be able to hold it for a year at the most, but not beyond that. Because if we allow that to happen, then no government of the day can function. Today it is the NDA, tomorrow it could be the UPA, but I think it is high time we all put our heads together. Obviously, a constitutional amendment is not possible given the current structure of the two houses. But some kind of convention is called for. Mr. Chari, I want to bring you in before I go to the politicians because you will bring the view of a professional who's been the Lok Sabha Secretary General for a very substantial amount of time. In a situation where you have a majority government in the lower house with a mandate and it has manifesto promises, if it wants to pass a bill that fulfills a manifesto promise but finds that it doesn't have a majority in the upper house, should the British Salisbury Convention apply? Well, the British Convention, in my view, doesn't uh, apply to our situation. So it shouldn't apply? We have a constitution, a written constitution, and uh, <coughs> the powers of both houses of parliament have been well defined. And we have procedures which are followed in both houses. On all these matches, passing of the bill and uh, raising discussions and but, but a whole I'll lot of things. But I ask a specific question. In the situation where a government with a majority in the lower house does not have a majority in the upper, you're saying manifesto promises should not be automatically passed by the upper house? No, see, uh, it's a, because such situations have arisen in the past also, where a party which came to power uh, in the general elections uh, they got a majority in the Lok Sabha, but they didn't have a majority in the Rajya Sabha. It's not the first time that it is happening. It has happened in, uh, a number of times. And in our the past. constitution means that you have to live with that. You can't certainly, circumvent it. Certainly, you have to live with that. But then, uh, you see, there is something called a political management. Uh, that is very, very important. In other uh, words, you have to accommodate your opponents to ensure that you get that, a majority. That is the Sambit essence. Patra, what you're hearing from Mr. Achari, who speaks not as a politician but as a professional who's been Secretary General of the Lok Sabha, is that our constitution requires that when you don't have a majority in the Rajya Sabha, even if you have a majority in the Lok Sabha, it's not conventions like the Salisbury Convention you need to push your legislation through. What you need is political management, the ability to accommodate your opponents and win them over. How do you respond to that? Uh, 
Karan, in fact, uh, I'm the youngest of the panelists today over here, and many are more learned, far more learned, and particularly Mr. Chari, who has more knowledge about the Constitution. But whatever I understand, I would say, and you would agree, that Constitution of the country, the governance of this country, means respecting the mandate, the manifesto, and the desire of the people. And if the government of the day, which has an overwhelming majority, cannot respect the desire of the people, cannot respect its own mandate, I believe that is a defeat of the Constitution. And that's the reason as to why, with evolving years of democracy in Britain, Lord Salisbury and thereafter, in, if I'm right, in uh, 1945, there was a tremendous victory for the Labour Party. And there were only 16 Labour Party members in the House of Lords. So Lord Salisbury and Lord Addition, Lord Salisbury from the Conservatives and Lord uh, Addition from the Labour Party came together and decided that people's desire have to be respected. Okay. So if something has been mentioned in the manifesto, then it should not be delayed or defeated by the House of Lords. It should go to the people. Okay. Don't you think this is a good proposition? I believe all my elders would agree to this, that people are the ones who should be respected. Pavel Varma, what lies at the heart of the Salisbury Convention in Britain, and also lies at the heart of Arun Jaitley's claim that we should have something similar in India, is the question of mandate. The lower house has a direct mandate, and when an election manifesto of a majority in the lower house is being passed, there is a real national mandate behind that. The upper house in India has at best an indirect mandate, in Britain it has no mandate at all because it's hereditary or by appointment. Do you not feel that the mandate of the upper house is not as good and strong as the mandate of the lower, and therefore when the lower house government has a popular sanction behind it because it won the election, the upper house should concede at least those bills that fit to its election manifesto. Uh, Karan, the constitution treats both houses of parliament on a completely equal footing and makes those exceptions which it believes would be a check on the mandate of the directly elected house, vis uh, namely money bills. As far as the Salisbury Convention is concerned, I believe we are comparing apples and origins because ab initio, the upper house in the United Kingdom is very different from the upper house here. The members may not be directly elected, but they are indirectly elected by state assemblies which have populations which make them one of the largest countries if they were countries by themselves in the world. So it is not that the Raj Sabha is not representative. Now, now, what really needs reform, and that is critical, is the manner in which the party which has a majority in the lower house manages parliament when it may be in a minority in the upper house. That is the area of reform which Mr. Arun Jaitley needs to learn. That's the point because Mr. Because the arrogance with which he has approached the house. That's not reform, that's the capacity that to is. politically manage opponents and win their support. That is the, but that's a different exactly. skill. Exactly. That's and not reform, fact, that's the skill no, of I political to, management. But you're right to point it out, Mr. Chari made that, that point. But that is what our constitution. Well, let me come back to the need for reform because that's what I want to talk about although you're right in pointing out that the counter to reform is better political management and the Indian constitution you could interpret to say actually calls for in these difficult situations political management rather than reform but Abhishek Singhvi in Britain the reforms that Arun Jaitley is suggesting we might want to adopt here go further than just the Salisbury Convention Britain has also passed two parliamentary acts. The first was 1911, which said that the House of Lords cannot delay a bill for more than two years, and that means bills that are both part of the election manifesto as well as bills about issues that the government has dreamt up after it got elected. And then in 49, the second parliamentary act reduced that period from two years to just one year. And so the position today is that in Britain, the House of Lords cannot delay a bill for more than one year because if it does, that bill is automatically considered passed. Do we need that as a law in our country, Abhishek Singhvi? Uh, Karan. Karan, you and I have both been students in that country and if you read the debates and the controversies before the passage of the Parliament Act of 1911, you will find that the entire focus is based 
on the nominated and the hereditary character of that house. That's the fundamental, in fact the basic focus was on the hereditary character. And that is why limitations were put. Secondly, and that is completely inept to apply to India. Secondly, and more importantly, I think the honest, straightforward way is to do it as the British did it with an act of parliament. They have no constitution. In our country with a constitutional amendment. You cannot do it by subterfuge or stealth. You cannot use a so-called convention as a substitute for constitutional amendment. And you know that you do not have, as we discussed in the debate just now, a constitutional amendment majority. Therefore, you do all these other things. If you have the consensus, generate it. Generate the consensus and do a constitutional amendment. And that's important, Karan, because as I said, when you start just touching one part of the constitution, the whole structure can't be just changed like that. Okay. It's a very integrated structure. You'll have to change 20 provisions if you start touching one part. And the, third the last aspect is that ultimately, it is also amounting to throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Bath water. You are, just consider one example, a telling example, you are now veering around to the view of the land acquisition bill that 90% of the proposals changes by us should have been accepted. Had you done it six months ago, a large part of the stalemate would not have arisen. Then you are throwing the baby out by saying, have a convention, have an amendment. We will not change. We will be intransigent. We will be obstinate. We will stick okay. to our intransigence. That's a fair point. change the constitution or without changing the constitution, import inapplicable doctrines like Salisbury Convention. That's really throwing the baby out of the bathwater. Nuresh Kujar, I'm going to go back to this second idea, not the Salisbury Convention, but the second idea that you pass a law that says that the Rajya Sabha cannot hold up any bill for more than a year or more than two years because if it does, the bill is deemed to have been passed anyway. Now, that may work in Britain because there the upper house is simply a second house. In India, the upper house actually represents the states. And it's quite possible that the lower house may have a government where many states are not represented at all. You know that from the days of the Janta government. South India was not represented in any adequate way in the Janta government at all. You also know that technically, just six states can form a government on their own in India. The six being UP, Bihar, Maharashtra, Bengal, Andhra and Tamil Nadu. They have 291 on their own, roughly 20 more than needed. So if you now deny